Uh, and now we'll commence with panel two, theme two, engineered places. Uh, we have um, Dr. Julie Zook from the College of Architecture and Dr. Lucia Carminati from the History Department. Um, Dr. Zook will present first and Lucia will present and Dr. Carminati will present second. Um, all right, Julie, are you ready? I am ready. You can hear all me right. and see everything okay? Yes. All right, let's go then. I want to talk about hospital corridor systems today. At face value, the only real job of hospital corridors or corridors generally is to transport, um, to enable transport by connecting rooms without disturbing what goes on and then too much. And from this point of view, a good corridor system is like a good butler. It conveys visitors to locations in such a way as to minimize confusion, fuss, and effort. And the best corridor systems would be the ones that you don't notice at all, so minute are the demands that they place on attention. But as an analogy, this doesn't really hit right. We all know that corridors do more than that. Uh, when we think about what's more, what, what hospitals do, what corridors do that's more, especially in regard to hospital spaces, we might start by looking particularly at the role of corridors and in institutions. Uh, and institutions exist to make things predictable. An important way that an important part of the way that they do this is by structuring social interactions. So that hospitals like prisons, workhouses, and schools are institutional buildings whose norms lead to consistency and human activity. Um, the architecture of institutions provides the backdrop and the conditions that perpetuate institutional norms for behavior and interaction. So the social structuring would be one of the functions of corridors above and beyond transport. That said, a lot of what happens in hospital corridor systems, especially for visitors, can neither be described as transport function, nor as a way of creating institutional norms. Uh, hospital corridor systems are unruly, and the difficulties that they present seem to be common knowledge. Uh, so let's look at uh, some crowdsourced descriptions of, of hospitals from Yelp to get a sense of the discomfort that hospital corridor systems provoke. Um, sometimes when you look at these kinds of comments, they're focused specifically on, on wayfinding difficulties. So here, Noel S. from Marietta, Georgia, I am also not a fan of trying to find my way around such a huge place with a lot of people who aren't paying attention. Or this one, Amar P. from McDonough, Georgia. Here to visit a friend and family. All employees, they're very helpful. It was a big hospital. I don't know where to go. And they took me all the way to my friend's room. But other of the comments are more focused on um, questions about how to be. Like, what, what's the appropriate way to, to act or think or feel? So this one from Willie G. in Arlington, Virginia. The facilities, though new, are just as cramped and nonsensical as the old buildings. The waiting rooms are in the hallways. There's absolutely no privacy. Or a tea foam from Smyrna, Georgia. This is a very nice and clean hospital. The main lobby is beautiful. They have several exhibits, such as the aviary exhibit inside with live birds and a garden pond with fishes. And then on the other hand, Leanne B. from Philadelphia. So I had the safety officer question me about taking a selfie. And here is Eric M. from Elizabeth, New Jersey. There were people here who looked like they were going for a place to hang out. People on laptops having full-blown conversations, walking around, TV was blasting, staff flirting with people walking in, nurses picking up their pizza outside. Hey, they got to eat. But even worse, there was a barbecue going on outside in the street serving workers. This is not a joke. It was a madhouse. Half the crowd looked like they were just hanging out and the rest looked like they actually had a medical emergency. I never saw something like this in my life. And last of all, Damien B from Atlanta. The reject case from any zombie movie mill about outside and inside. So these comments can be seen as casting the shadows that outline what is strange in hospital corridor systems. And they point to problems in the exact areas where hospital corridors are meant to, to work, how to get places and, and, and also conveying a sense of the activities that are appropriate to the institution. In addition to experiencing basic wayfinding problems, these, these 
visitors were confused about how to act, especially when they saw things like waiting rooms in the stream of traffic, photogenic aviaries, but also uh, knee-jerk policing of photography and party tech activities in the same time in the same place as medical emergencies. The eventual use of a zombie metaphor was, was probably foreseeable. These visitors were lost in at least two senses of the word. Hospital corridors are remarkably resistant to the purposes to which we might try to put them. So at this point, I want to step back a little bit and think about the corridor as a spatial type on its own terms before coming back to hospital corridor systems and, and even um, I'm gonna discuss how they might be better designed. Um, Roger Luckhurst has a, has a new book about the history of corridors uh, that, that I quite recommend. He uses the term distributive corridor to distinguish specifically modern forms of this space type from their ceremonial and religious predecessors. In doing so, he identifies corridors as a distinctly modern spatial type. Corridors literally shape our access to one another, and it is perhaps because of this power that they have a history of being conscripted, in, conscripted into schemes for utopia and for a reform. It may also be the reason that in contemporary media, corridor imagery is often used to invoke dread and malaise. So let's look at a handful of examples. This is an early example of a utopian corridor that can be found related to Charles Fourier's development, development of the phalanstery. The, the name of the phalanstery is derived from the Greek term phalanx for a tightly banded group of soldiers. The phalanstery emerged from Fourier's notion that the ideal society could be fostered by ideal architecture. And for him, this meant a communal form of living in a continuous building that acted as an entire town and completely reorganized familial and social life based on loving association um, and, and all of it enabled by corridors. These were buildings as communities into which individuals were organized to live by age, work and leisure were provided for, and all was connected by a corridor system comprised mostly of a weather conditioned gallery running all along the second floor of the building. Fourier was inspired by the galleries of London, of the Louvre, beg your pardon, and Parisian arcades. And, and so his utopia was accordingly uh, one of corridors. And this, interestingly, is the Texas version of it. There was a, there was a plan to create one of these uh, not kind of near the Dallas area and the, the people arrived, hundreds of people arrived, but it was never actually constructed. You can see it was a, built on pretty much the identical scheme. And for those of you who live in Texas, you'll, you'll recognize that form of cloud perhaps. This is a sort of familiar site around Dallas. Um, so, but a, a, apart from corridors sort of being part of these utopian schemes about how to live, can't really talk about corridors without also talking about the history as a coercive type. Um, hospitals in particular belong to the class of buildings that are described in space syntax theory as the reversed type. In this social conception of space, reverse types embody top-down order, the architectural inscription of social differences, and a primary concern with controlling permeability. Uh, reverse types invest heavily in the creation and maintenance of boundaries and of behavioral protocols that are associated with specific spaces. And sort of the signature move of a reverse type, according to this way of thinking, is that they put some inhabitants in the deep and non-distributed spaces of a floor plan, such as prisoners and cells, students and classrooms, and the sick and patient rooms. And these occupants are surveilled and controlled by another class of occupant who's usually a professional who moves more or less freely through the corridors, applying their expertise. Um, reverse types are often associated with pathology and with the reform of pathology. And so this is, a, this is a, an image of an asylum, of the Glasgow Asylum, where you can kind of see the corridor becoming a space of surveillance or a sort of panoptic space fairly fairly clearly in a space by which to control permeability, not only the flow of persons, but also of information. Um, the sociologist Irving, Irving Gottman created the term total institution to describe the, the brute force of the asylum as a type and as he observed it through the 50s and, and, and wrote on it or published on it in 1961. These are the kinds of places that erase the boundary between the self and the environment. But even there, he noted there were free spaces in the asylums that he studied. And they were generally found in specific snippets of hallway, places where one could do things undetected or unmonitored or unconstrained. And he saw these spaces as, uh, as spaces of refusal. 
And he saw them as accepted and even supported by chronically overwhelmed institutional administrations. So that function, the resistance function, is, 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 often, is often built in. So hospital corridor systems have utopian aspects, such as an openness that mixes all the roles and social locations and gives access to all places, but they also seem to exert uh, some limits and to inspire some diffidence and to control the activities that one can undertake in space. And this reflects our origins in reform. And, and, and then again, as in the case that Eric B was very concerned about, they are subject to reappropriation to sort of ground up activities. So corridors on one hand clearly fortify architectural institutional practices. But when we think about contemporary hospital corridors, they're often the places in hospitals where norms fall apart. So a patient gets guided to the wrong place or a nurse scolds a doctor or a person just cries in the open. Um, there is a generative social function of corridors, which is recognized in the literature on uh, knowledge work, especially not so much on hospitals that corridors are where people run into each other and thus new knowledge is created. Okay, so hospital corridor systems uh, it, it become this example of a lot of the attributes that distributive corridors can take on. They, they, they sort of gather many of them into one building type more than other building types that depend on corridors like hotels. There are also um, places in which to get lost, but first I wanna talk a little bit about the way that they appear in, um, in sort of the, the cultural imaginary. Um, when we look at films with, with corridors in them, they're usually places where one's humanity is under a sort of threat, and that's either happening because of their bureaucratic nature, and Jacques Tati's movie Playtime is, is a really delightful example of, of that kind of thing, or there's something much more Baroque and much more dread, uh, dread inspiring about it. Dawn of the Dead is a classic example, and Us is another fantastic example of the sort of Baroque corridor. Again, the theme to me appears to be uh, one's personhood is, is at stake in some way. One's personhood is threatened in some way. So in addition to these things, corridors are also places, hospital corridors are places where we get lost. <laughs> and and uh, this is a really common experience. So I want to I want to actually shift now into talking about some issues of corridor design. This is my area of teaching very strongly. So this is sort of part of my pro my professional practice. Um, the problem that leads so many hospital corridors to be difficult in terms of wayfinding is that there's a tension between the physical and organizational complexity of a hospital and the personal need for something that's intelligible. And navigable. Uh, wayfinding is a cognitive process and it's mostly happening without us thinking about it, but occasionally the wayfinding problems make their way to the fore because we have to do something that's a, a bit demanding in a particular way and it is quite cognitively demanding when you have to start thinking about wayfinding problems. The idea of the cognitive dimension of wayfinding has been widely and erroneously thought of as having a fairly literal map in your head, uh, which is in the sense of it has all the locations and all of the relationships and it's filled in in some sort of detail. And, and what, where this has led to problems is that architects have been, have been advised to do things that make for nice maps. Um, which is to say that they're advised to make forms that have good gestalt or good form properties with the idea that somehow the person is going to encode that map because it's essentially attractive and then pull it up when it's time for them to wayfind. And we have a lot of um, empirical research indicating that's, that doesn't work. For the most part, it doesn't work. That's not how our brains work. And that's not how our navigation works on the ground. Um, so instead, I would propose, so, so we have here a case where uh, uh, this is a, a well-designed hospital. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disclose the architect. It's a good hospital, good practice. And you can see sort of where that big arrow is. There's an attempt to kind of wedge the pieces of the hospital around there and then make these fairly memorable shapes. The problem is um, there's too many frames of reference uh, geometrically, and, I, and it's quite hard to sort of uh, 
distinguish where you are. There's, it's, it's a bit too deep and complex. And while triangles seem like they might be sort of a memorable shape, they're actually quite disorienting. A good general strategy is to design layouts with corridors that have a hierarchy that you can kind of register as a user with or without ever seeing a map. Uh, you can have a, 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 the layout should be designed so that there's a core of primary corridors that are well connected, made of not that many elements. They're pretty straight and it kind of spans the layout while connecting to things. A, another way to, to sort of, another strategy that can be brought into play, something that's happening here, this is a, a hospital in Oslo, is to sort of offload some of the wayfinding functions. So you have a primary system and then it offloads to a series of secondary systems. It, it seems that we generally kind of hit reset when we pass from a primary system to a secondary system, but done in sort of a clear way. And this approach finds a lot of analogies in city street networks um, where you have kind of more, more of a primary network and then quieter areas within it. And also you can see in the, in the example as a diagram at the right, there are little deflections, but they're not quite full turns. And, and based on you know, a reading that I share with some colleagues of the research literature, you're probably gonna perceive that as one line. You're not gonna be memorizing turns to use this thing that travels up and down the page, but it, it's a nice way to sort of break up the sort of potentially panoptic look and feel of such a corridor without inducing wayfinding difficulties. Um, so I want to also discuss getting back to uh, the sort of imagery issue. Um, I want to discuss uh, uh, regarding the strange space of hospital corridors, uh, the idea that designers erode the potential of these systems when they try to suppress the identity of the hospital as an institution. Um, this is this is, by the way, an image from from this. Uh, so you sometimes see efforts like this in hospital corridors. And, and when you sort of bolt a hospitality style corridor onto an otherwise very sort of functionalist hospital layout, it's kind of problematic. And, and the, the sort of working theory that I have around this or the working hypothesis I guess I have around this is that one of the ways that uh, that I conceive of situating architectural experiences that architecture stages us in ways and we have to imaginatively project into and engage with an environment. Uh, and, and in doing so, we, we kind of have a provisional sense of self as we use space. And so when the shaping of an institutional interior seems like it's designed to conceal its own purposes, it disrupts our capacity to engage imaginatively, imaginatively with the architectural setting. And so the features of the, of the setting that are meant to make us feel at ease become actually a source of disquiet. We sense something's kind of off. Um, now, this actually, this is a really beautiful hospital, uh, New York Presbyterian David Koch uh, Center. Um, it, it's a bunch of outpatient services, but including some, some, some heavy things like radiology and diagnostics. The sort of architectural division of labor that I'm talking about that the end user is kind of doing here um, is sometimes built really deeply into projects. So this, uh, this project um, Pay Cobb Freedom Partners did the cladding, which has these sort of slats built into a triple glazed wall assembly. And they did the lobby, which is very nice looking. I will read you the architect's statement about it. The gracious lobby provides a respite from the surrounding congested streets and sidewalks. A wood ceiling in the lobby creates a calming environment enhanced by extensive daylight and vivid artwork. The wood, stone, and natural materials throughout the interior spaces of the facility uh, evoke comfort and ease. Okay, so it was a different architecture firm or pair of architecture firms that did the floor plan. And so what we have here is um, the outside of the L is daylit, the inside of the L and the sort of two, the two ends are, are not, I'm sorry, the inside of the L is not, it, it's, a, it's abutted to another building. 
What they've done, just to clarify, is that the whole outside, the whole daylit perimeter is given over to visitor circulation and some waiting lobbies. And then you pass from that, from that sort of shallow interface back into the plan to undergo an exam or, or treatment or whatever and leave again as the patient. And in the meantime, the, the healthcare workers spend their entire day in the back of the building with no access to windows and with no actual solidarity with the patients. The, 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 the reason for the relationship is the meeting to administer the, the medical care. And it, there is to me a, a poor treatment of labor inherent in this. Um, and uh, I'll, again, I'll read you the architect statement. Circulation is clear with a separation of onstage, offstage flows. So patients and families can travel along the light filled perimeter corridors with clear wayfinding and staff can move efficiently throughout the building, minimizing disruption to patients. This is an interesting conceptualization of the, the extra procedural, extra exam relationship of healthcare worker to patient. Um, beyond that being kind of a labor issue, there's a really problematic idea that what is aesthetically pleasing or important in things like cladding or lobbies is not important to, to function. To, to sort of the, the medical functions of such buildings. And, and that to me, it, it becomes a mood about corridor. Uh, I, want to, I want to give a, an example that I actually think is quite positive in this regard. And this is Rafael Moneo's Marignon um, Pediatric and Maternity Hospital in Madrid. So the exterior is sort of this really, um, this is a 2003 building, uh, this metal cladding and it has these seams and the seams sort of regulate and run across the windows and, and, and act as mullions. It's a very externally ordered building. Um, and I'm gonna actually pop forward. This is a, the plan. It's formed around eight courtyards um, that are organized by a sort of orthogonal grid of corridors and their widths seem a little bit parameterized by the uh, by the, the roles that one expects to use them so the widest ones are public that are mixing of all people and then as you move to the left around the, the horizontal corridors they become a bit narrower because it's the patient groups and their families and the care staff and um, and so on uh, so the rational features and the strict geometry and we also have these sort of very light filled spaces um, work together to project an institutional character of organizational efficiency. But there's also a sort of a humaneness and a hygiene. Um, there is a way here that the interior form of the building projects a, um, an image of the hospital as a specifically beneficent institution. Um, the, the courtyards and the single loaded corridors admit dead, daylight so to, to virtually every space. And the greatest, uh, the greatest expanses of corridor are actually, uh, I'm sorry, of glazing are dedicated to the corridors. And these are sort of detailed in such a way you can kind of see a subtle layering from the glazing inward. So it becomes a little bit soft. It becomes a little bit of a broken up space rather than something super stark. An interesting thing about this hospital is that the the visual characteristics are consistent throughout. So if you go and find, you know, imagery of office spaces or labs or ORs, they all have the sort of same visual quality. And that is a, is a kind of solidarity or offers a kind of solidarity that you see absent when there's this like really um, polarization between the planning, uh, which is the sort of functional layout and the design as in the prior example. Um, and then here's one of my favorite things about this hospital. Uh, we spoke of the panoptic corridor, uh, which is sort of controlling the patient by, uh, by surveilling them and, and monitoring their permeability. And this is a, a view from a patient room across a corridor, across, I beg your pardon, across to a corridor. And in it, you see uh, a, a kind of a, a sort of everyday drama. Uh, of hospital, of the, the life of the institution that the patient has access to. So they, they, they're, they're seen, but they also see. And, and again, this is a, a sort of solidarity. Um, so just Moneo directly describes this connection to the hospital type as a scientific institution, a specific type of scientific institution. 
that answers to human experience. And he says that a hospital should be clear, clean, and luminous. It should have the logic one expects from science for those who are in sickness to seek its aid. It should offer the patients and their families every convenience, and it should create an atmosphere of calm, tranquility, and rest. And it should reflect all of its elements, uh, in all of its elements, the value of hygiene for health. And he refers to this as um, clarity, cleanness, and brightness that are attributes of hygiene and also this architecture which we would like to describe as rational and optimistic. So maybe getting back to the prior question about hygiene, this is a particular adopting of hygiene as a mood that signals something about a commitment to it, about a, a, an institution's commitment to, uh, to forms of care that are informed by science. And, and that is sort of an embracing of the of the um, institutional identity that when you see the adverse, when, when you see somebody, when you see the presentation of the hospital as a recreational, uh, sorry, as a, as a hospitality type space, or sometimes they're presented as a sort of gallery type spaces that carries its own set of problems that extend often or find their sort of expression often in corridor systems. In closing, Corridor systems give architectural form to connections, which is to say that corridors shape the terms of our access to each other. Hospital corridor systems have a generative potential in spite of their history of coercion. They can prompt us away from role-driven self-concepts and behaviors and toward less rigidly forms of uh, rigidly arbitrated forms of interaction. They also absolutely engage our cognition and they can engage our imagination. Um, they create an impression of the specific institution with which we might find ourselves engaged. Um, what I'm proposing here is two normative statements about hospital corridor systems. First, that they should answer to the specific capacities of the human cognitive system. And second, that they should be shaped to construct a relationship of the individual to the institution. These are the two problems often raised by hospital corridors. Where am I? How am I supposed to be? And they correspond to the status of corridors as both collectors of networked places and um, as places in their own right. In corridor systems, an institutional morphology of form meets an individual morphology of experience. Corridor system design that suppresses the expression of the hospital as an institution does hospitals and their users a disservice as though the hospital and its occupants are both somehow in the wrong from the outset. Corridor systems can not only convey the rational and predictable dimensions of hospitals, but can also create visual, spatial, and imaginative conditions that add meaning to daily life in their institutional settings. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie, for that fascinating talk. Um, next up, we have Lucia Carminati uh, from the History Department. She'll be presenting her paper um, fecal matters, refuse, and olfaction in the history of Port Said and the Suez Canal region. Thank you very much. And um, I hope you can all see my screen all right. Yeah? <laughs> yes, it looks good. Great, thank you so much. So thanks everyone uh, for, uh, for being here. Uh, thanks to Julie and Jacob for inviting me and putting together such a, an exciting uh, group of presenters. Uh, I look forward to uh, your question and, and, and to the discussion. I'm a social and cultural historian of the modern Middle East. Uh, and in particular, I researched the history of migration and labor in the 19th century and early 20th century Mediterranean and Egypt. My book in the making is about the excavation of the Suez Canal uh, starting in the 1850s across the Ottoman Egyptian territory of the Isthmus of Suez. I'm writing this book from the standpoint of the male and female migrant workers who made the canal project ultimately possible. Today, I will present the embryo of a future uh, project that will require more work and analysis, since I welcome any critiques and suggestions you may have. 
And today I will first outline the setting of my study, and then I will explore a specific angle that I would like to more extensively employ in my future research. And finally, I will show why discussing health, the conjuncture of architectural and historical contexts can be productive and meaningful. In April 1860, what would later be known as a port city by the name of Port Said on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt consisted of just 11 large wooden houses, scattered tents and huts, and piles of wood. This center had been founded the year before, in 1859, as the first and northernmost work site organized by a private company, the so-called Universal Company of the Maritime Canal at Suez. A few years prior, the Egyptian ruler, Said, entrusted the company with the task of excavating the isthmus of Suez southwards and unite the Mediterranean and the Red Seas, an undertaking that had been dreamt, planned, and attempted for several centuries and by multiple actors in history. Coming last in this long line, the French diplomat, uh, a French diplomat called Ferdinand de Lucie, would ultimately claim the paternity of the canal project. From the onset, a mixed throng of migrants and adventurers from the rest of Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, and European countries had inhabited this port city. By the end of 1860, one year after its foundation, the expansion of Port Said and the development of its workshops had made the first urban plans redundant. Houses, hangars, workshops had sprung up uncharted. By 1861, a small city inhabited by 4,000 Egyptians and Europeans had developed. Shops, hotels, bazaars, but also workshops, forges, steam-operated sawmills were in full swing. By the end of Port Said's first decade of life in 1869, when, by the way, the uh, Suez Canal would be officially inaugurated, around 10,000 people were reportedly dwelling in this city. Of these, 1,500 were said to be Egyptian. There were about 3,000 Greeks, 2,000 French, 1,500 Austrians, predominantly Slavic and Dalmatian, and the rest was said to be composed of Italians and Maltese. Sources also identify many of the workers as Arabs from Syria. In spite of the building frenzy, more housing projects were needed, and no matter how quickly new buildings arose, some individuals were sleeping in the streets. They had often come to the city seeking jobs, had hardly anything to eat, and could find no shelter. In the early 1870s, one decade after the foundation of Port Said in 1859, had someone happened to cruise eastwards along the northern Mediterranean coast of Egypt, they would have caught sight above the sea surface of a mass of low brown houses. Vis visitors would right away spot have spotted a considerable crowd moving all along the docks. But it was not just the vision of Port Said, as is 1869 engraving, almost a still life would suggest. It was not just the vision of Port Said that struck visitors. The northern port city also penetrated travelers' nostrils from afar. Some explicitly recalled that while they were still on board, their peculiar olfactory experience in the town's harbor actually diverted their attention away from the grandiose spectacle of the sea. In fact, wastewaters imbibed the soil of Port Said and its cesspits let out exhalations that could go hardly unnoticed. What is more, the town's slaughterhouse, located near the town's northern shore, exuded a nauseating stench. Of course, newcomers may have experienced their arrival to this brand new city in a number of different ways, not just through their eyes or their noses. However, I'm hypo hypothesizing that it was smell that first and foremost dictated the everyday life of, of Port Said's inhabitants and ultimately drove its urban changes in the decades following its foundation in 1859. 
A few peculiar features characterized Port Said's urban as well as social development. Presenting them gives me the opportunity to highlight how its urban and social histories actually merge together and can hardly be disentangled. First of all, the encampment that had been turned into a city quite quickly had been employed, had been emplaced on a spit of sand between a lake and the Mediterranean Sea, as this map um, created in 1869 shows. It was what a, what a later author defined a port against nature. In fact, its morphology had to be overturned and transformed so that this spot could become a suitable mooring place for the biggest ocean going ships. Moreover, it was also completely deprived of building materials and those building materials which it needed had to be carried over from elsewhere. Meanwhile, Port Said had to make do. As the digging of the basins and the canal progressed, more and more mud and sand were removed from the excavated areas and distributed in other lower areas so that the ground level was raised and the soil became ready for construction. As soon as new, so-called new land was created in this fashion, new constructions were raised. Second feature, especially notable from a public health perspective, is that the surface of the town was, was flat and only four to five feet above sea level. This combined with the fact that the soil was mo moisty and composed of sand meant that Port Said's surface retained almost all of its wastewaters and fecal matters. In the third place, as shown in this enlarged detail on the left, Port Said had been, since its inception, divided into a distinct European quarter and an Arab so-called village, uh, uh, of course, a belittling nickname. This was unlike other major Euro Egyptian cities, for example, the capital of Cairo or Alexandria, where there was no so-called dual city model often of colonial or semi-colonial origin as in French North Africa. Since 1861, the Canal Company, having been given some leeway in this realm by the Egyptian government, had started designing urban plans for its different encampments that were in gestation all along the length of the canal. Company officials reportedly built Port Said according to, and I'm quoting, an architecture of common sense, an architecture of the future, encompassing all hygienic conditions and complying with all the needs of comfort. The company undertook the creation of houses for the residents of its personnel. And by doing so, the company imbued Port Said's urban plans with ideas of moral order, notions of social peace, and a quite a strong dose of paternalism liberally forced on its workers. But in spite of urban segregation, according to sources near the company that tended to portray the city in this rosy light that this postcard captures, living conditions were potentially optimal in both the European and the Arab sides of town. In the European quarter, there were straight roads, fountains with drinking water, charming promenades, Pretty houses all lined up in tidy rows stood near the sea that washed ashore the shells decorating the beach. Houses were covered with plaster and were airy and dry. In the Arab part of town, houses were made of adobe, wood, canes, and bricks. Constructions were perfectly aligned on four or five rows and were separated by mathematically straight roads. According to contemporary Western observers, the Arab village was thus a place where the indistinct mass of the town's Arabs were given the chance to live in wholesome and clean houses rather, rather than in the hedges and dark, dirty hovels that were allegedly found in the rest of Egypt. And this was, of course, um, a very biased uh, Western perspective. So smell played an important role in driving these urban policies and transformations. 
In particular, the Canal Company officials uh, who were tasked with matters of sanitation, urbanism and construction on the Isthmus of Suez, they were guided by the principle that miasmas, vapors of polluted air ought to be prevented that first of all they existed and then they ought to be prevented and eliminated to ensure the health of the public. They abided by the theory, by the idea that cesspools, slaughterhouses, cemeteries, marshes, and stagnant water uh, were potential sources of putrid air or, or miasma that could be released from decomposing bodies. Miasma-based theories were so hard to eradicate that they survived the germ theory based on the microscopic detection of the microbes that Louis Pasteur formulated in the 1880s. In 1886, a medical official in Port Said, for example, reported that miasmatic effluvia wafted out of liquid fecal matters in town and could cause infectious diseases. The long sickness of the children of uh, a Mr. Cohen, for example, was blamed on the harmful exhalations that the yard of a nearby house supposedly left, left out. Its tenants had no cesspools for the draining of their dirty waters and reportedly had no choice but to discard all their refuse into their yard. Whether real or perceived, the effects of ordure and odor lingered near people's hearts as well as noses. As historians of Europe have argued before, a steady process of deodorization had been taking place since the 18th century in Western societies. And such disgust for smells produced its own form of social power. Foul smelling garbage appeared to threaten the social order while the unfailing advancement of the hygienic and the fragrant promised to buttress the stability of society. Doctors, engineers, and uh, architects worked in unison to develop European cities accordingly. Historians of 19th century Egypt have shown that the country, that country as well, experienced new ways of perceiving the public space and reorganizing society. Official decrees uh, described the Egyptian urban space as chaotic, overcrowded, smelly. It appeared as a space that needed to be cleaned up, ordered, and ultimately disciplined. Sorry. So going back to our particularly smelly spot for today, Port Said, well, this was a city that literally sat or floated on refuse, on refuse. As outlined before, most of the land on which it grew was reclaimed, either from the lake bottom or from the sand dunes along the sea, along the seashore. But the city itself also produced waste of its own. In the mid 1860s, the inhabitants seemingly discarded the dirt of their homes in the streets. They also let trickle or disposed of soapy, greasy, or industrial waters in the streets or in yards, instead of disposing them in dry wells that they were supposed to provide and pay for themselves. Dry wells ought to be filled with dry stone and covered with a layer of gravel and then uh, another layer of sand. Seemingly, people also neglected to bring their urine to latrines or to place uh, where the waters discarded from stables and manure also uh, were supposed to be disposed of. Finally, inhabitants used to kill, skin, and chop animals within the, perime the perimeter of the, uh, of the living quarters, throwing and abandoning blood and other debris in the street rather than burying them right away. In May 1866, representatives of the Egyptian sanitary authorities complained to, comp to company officials that the surroundings of the towns uh, were, as I'm, and I'm quoting, dirty, of the kind of dirt that makes even approaching impossible, given how dirty it is in the front of it, behind, and all around. 
shops at both the Arab and the Greek bazaars needed to be cleaned up. Moreover, suspicious trickles poured from the hallways of the public latrines onto the street and let out a harmful smells that affected all the inhabitants. To such complaints, company officials reacted by blaming the general filthiness on, in turn, the inhabitants, whether shopkeepers or their customers, local sweepers, or Egyptian uh, guards, Egyptian officers. Representatives of the company were, I argue in my work, unwilling to invest much into the city's public health. They did not consider their organization responsible for the town's sanitary state. At best, they envisioned a monitoring role for themselves and recommended either repression or removal. They did not really worry about uh, assuaging or uh, addressing the very urge that moved the town's bowels in the first place. Around the same time when this exchange over public health in Port Said took place, the Egyptian ruler and the company were trying to accommodate their divergences or the disagreements that had quickly arose between them over the management of the Isthmus and its uh, new cities. They had submitted their differences to the nominally impartial decision of the French ruler, Napoleon III. In fact, the Suez Canal Company was formally called the Universal Canal Company, but it was a substantially French company. According to the outcome of this arbitration, the Egyptian government had to disperse to the company indemnities of dozens millions of francs. These were due for withdrawing the commitment, the previous commitment to provide forced Egyptian labor and lands that the Egyptian government had previously promised or granted to the company for the canal work sites. The arbitration also decreed that no portion of these lands on the Isthmus of Suez could be subject to speculation. However, the company strongly hoped to benefit from the sale of the lands on the Isthmus that it had previously received for free from the Egyptian government. And it was so hopeful that it actually anticipated recovering in this way the expenses that it had, it had met to undertake the canal project itself. So the company's eye on the Isthmus real estate may in part explain why in 1869, the Suez Canal Company obtained the Voirie uh, or the Tanzim, the sort of the service that was in charge of the maintenance or the cleaning uh, of roads. Uh, the company obtained the management of this service for Port Said and the other canal cities from the Egyptian government. But in 1872, 1877, and then 1884, this service would change hands over and over again. In 1872, the service was returned to the Egyptian government. In 1877, after the Egyptian administration had been declared bankrupt and had been placed under French and British financial control and political control, the service would be entrusted to a new entity called Domaine Cumont created in 1869 and jointly participated by the Egyptian government and by the company. So theoretically, this new entity was meant to administer the land along the canal and share the revenue deriving from its sale. Uh, however, the domain was essentially controlled by the company. So company sources defensively reported that management fretted to elaborate solutions for the town's defaulting sanitary state. However, even they had to admit that finding concrete solutions actually proved time after time elusive. Actually, unlike what this picture suggests that the water closet nicely and neatly evolved from one stage to another, Different attempts at sanitation in Port Said, ranging from dry wells to mobile soil tubs, coexisted and were long debated and contested. 
in spite of the claims of company representatives, a much less sanitized and fragrant picture of Port Said emerges from its gutters. According to a source produced in 1884 that was close to the Anglo-Egyptian government that was in power by then after the 1882 British invasion of the country. So according to this Anglo-Egyptian source that could have been biased in, in its own way, well, Port Said's inhabitants were essentially left to their own devices when dealing with waste. Workers built uncemented, unventilated cesspools underground that accounted for a good deal of the horrible smell which was perceived on walking through the streets. And I was quoting. Others feared, other workers feared even worse as they lived in houses that were not provided with cesspools at all and resorted to throwing their refuse onto the street. Those who did have cesspools uh, could employ a night cart for the removal of their contents, which were then deposited on the beach. And this beach at the northern, northern end of town was often, and I'm quoting, in most disgusting condition, being covered with fecal matters, the carcasses of animals, and all the indescribable in refuse of a town. According to the author of this report, public health and real estate were tightly connected. The fact that the company could still profit nicely from land speculation in Port Said may have itself fostered its carelessness of public health. When it comes to assessing the company's approach to public health specifically, the available studies on the history of the Suez Canal that are strongly marked by an emphasis on technology, on the history of technology, business, and architecture, well, they tend to apologetically argue that the company had always been keen on applying strict hygienic measures in order to ensure the well being of its workforce. However, my preliminary work finds that not to be the case. It shows that the company implemented changes in waste disposal uh, in the Isthmus cities and especially in Port Said only piecemeal and after carefully weighing costs and benefits for itself. Meanwhile, inhabitants had to uh, find ways to overcome the heap of dirt and the pungent smell within and outside their homes. So to conclude, I want to offer uh, a few tentative remarks. First of all, while the history of sanitation could well be reduced to a history of technological innovation spearheaded by a few male uh, engineers, the effect would be to write bodies and discourse out of the story. From a methodological standpoint, the history of waste and smell must find its rightful place in the history of the senses and establish the plausible historical value of both trash and odor with the awareness that the very notion of waste fluctuated and changed meanings in time, and that olfaction was far from being a biologically established uh, sensorium. Perhaps the historian who dabbles in excrements and emphasizes, emphasizes the historical prominence of, uh, of trash runs the risk of falling to the same hygienist's obsession with dirt and smell. And yet the history of trash shows the 19th century poignancy of such obsession, connected as it was to public health, urban management, as well as social control. Secondly, we need to rely on uh, both sight and the sense of smell to shore up a history of the towns, of these towns built in inequalities. As outlined above, the company invested the whole town with social expectations articulated through architecture and urbanism, both in its European and Arab sections. Meanwhile, filth and odor afflicted both urban halves. In spite of the similarities among them, however, they, these two halves, remained characterized by uneven infrastructural development. Homes and sewers in the Arab quarter were more, vo more vulnerable to natural calamities than those in the European areas. <laughs>
the uh, as shown in this 1911 map, the fact that the supposedly Arab part of town, the so-called Arab village, um, shown uh, more clearly on the in, on the left, uh, housed this this section of the city housed the town slaughterhouse, uh, accommodated the infectious disease hospital, and uh, it was it was um, a very close to the infested beach that I've described before. So this sort of shows its disadvantaged position in the town's smellscape. Dwellers in the supposedly European part of town employed, enjoyed better infrastructure than the inhabitants of the Arab so-called village. Finally, the third point that I wanna raise in while approaching my conclusion is that the disposal of trash played a particularly symbolic role in Port Said. This was originally improvised as a gateway for the workers, the machinery, the supplies needed to excavate the canal. It, it quickly became a city in its own right and produced an ever increasing volume of waste. So on the one hand, I argue that as the new waterways Northern Harbor, Port Said embodied the ideals of flow and movement. At the same time, however, it became the epitome of stagnation. In Port Said, surface and underground, earth and water, land and sea were mashed together. Albeit not visibly, a suffused stench persistently signaled that what ought to remain hidden actually overflew, and what ought to float away actually lingered on and became stagnant. As a tourist guidebook published in 1876 dryly declared, there was nothing in particular to see in town, it was just an uncomfortable place surrounded by water and sand. Well, there may not have been much to see in late 19th century Port Said, but there definitely was a lot to smell. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. That was that was great. Um, so I I do have a quest, a, a sort of big picture question. I'm not sure I will be able to get it out in in, in a quick and sort of efficient way. And we are running a little bit short on time. So if anyone wants to jump in and has any pressing questions that they want to get in before we kind of have to transition to the next panel, um, please, uh, please do so now. Okay, um, well, I, I will go ahead, go forward and ask this question then. Um, so both papers are really, really fascinating, um, and I really enjoyed both. And um, they're so different in a lot of ways, but they also they do come together around the sort of bigger picture, picture issue of design, specifically uh, on different scales, of course, and in different contexts. But um, it made me think, it, it, and the and the approaches were were so different. Uh, so it made me think about when we're trying to bring these two areas together about what kind of balance um, we need to strike between sort of talking about intentionality and in design and sort of the contingency of history in, in, in sort of the objects that we're looking at. So with Julie specifically, you know, I was thinking about this hospital, um, the Presbyterian Hospital funded by the Cope, the Cope family, is that correct? And, and, and sort of the, the, um, the very sort of obvious concrete sort of manifestations of the sort of, uh, sort of um, attitudes towards labor uh, that, that seem to be expressed in that building. I mean, how much of that, it, that building, that design of that building, should we, um, I, I mean, how much of our analysis of that building should take into account the intentional design versus sort of the historical accidents in which the, the designers Kind of found themselves at the time. So the sources of the funding, the the, the space the, that was available at the time, you know, thinking of Lucia's paper there, Port Said itself, kind of in, you know, it 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 makes do as 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 you say with with the land, the topography that 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 was there. So you know, what kind of balance do we need to kind of strike between intentional design and kind of making do when we're approaching our our subjects? Oh, Lucia, do you want to start? <laughs> um, 
well that's a that's a very interesting question is and i will provide the historian's answer <laughs> which is that um absolutely i think uh, you know it's in 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 hindsight as we often work um and what i've been trying to do in my own work is to show how multifaceted and how many different aspects and how many different interests converged in the construction of the social fabric and the urban fabric of this of this town and so unlike what most uh, available studies on the on the history of the canal company and the Suez canal unlike what they've been doing by only sort of siding with one kind of perspective which is the canal company officials perspective the uh, the 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 technical side of things as 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 the what the town should look like or what it should smell like uh, and so you know the blueprints the canal company blueprints would suggest a much more sanitized a much more fragrant um, environment uh, well i tried to juxtapose to those a number of different other uh, voices and um, testimonies that um, sort of portray a different picture or offer up a different experience of the city. And so I am neither siding with the idea that uh, Canal Company officials intentionally made this uh, a living hell, uh, nor do I want to sort of exclude that there could have been uh, some sort of instrumental reliance on contingency on their end when it came to their own benefit and, and, and gain and um, financial advantage. And so it's, 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 it's neither nor in a way, there was neither intention or, nor contingency in a way, but we, I think that we have to at least acknowledge the complexity. So from my end in this particular talk, um, I'm advocating a fairly narrow position that is seeking to redefine some of these problems in terms of how they condition social spaces as experienced. And um, for those of you coming from outside of architecture, that's not a totally typical approach. It's often a part of typical approaches, and I probably went farther with it than, than, than would be typical. The problem that you're pointing to is there's really no systems level account for where these things are coming from. That's 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 there. You know, that I, I'm not sort of tracing back up to the conditions under which these kinds of other conditions, uh, these more local conditions are produced. And um, that is sort of an interesting, I, I would love to hear what either of the other architects on this talk would, how, how they might reflect on it, because I think it's more developed in their work than in mine. But um, I think that is becoming a more, um, based on my experience, a more active conversation right now is, is you know, um, ways that we, it's a profession, totally relying on our clients might start to advocate for different higher level or bigger level systems. It, it's, it's not actually something architects have a lot of power to do. But I'm curious if, uh, if, if uh, either Professor Theodore or Professor Gibson has something to add. That's a big one. <laughs> um... I, I, architects have never had much power uh, about systems. Architects, uh, what makes architecture powerful has always been its clients. So if you can do something for the, you know, the, the king of Spain, you, you're powerful. If you can't, you're, you're not quite powerful. There's, there's not a lot of power in architecture itself. So um, I think you're right. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that architects shouldn't do anything. Uh, it just means that they're not doing as much as they think they do. We also have a question from Joseph Aranya. He's uh, raising his hand. Um, 
Match. Talk. Okay, talking. Sorry, that was a mistake. Okay. Never mind then. Okay, thank you. Um, I can. I have. A, I can ask. A, do you already have a question in the queue? No, it. it um, that was a mistake. So. I mean, I guess this just just to connect the the two papers. Um, you know, Lucia talked a lot about sense as a driver in terms of um, urban transformation and historical change in a particular location. So I'm worried, uh, I'm, I'm, I wonder if, um, Julie, if you've thought about how um, um, the objection of the objections that come along with um, sense uh, might be a motivation for some of the kinds of spaces and um, aesthetics that you uh, explored in the hospital, for example, like the, the, between the forest like landscape. And one of them, as well as um, some of the um, um, visual qualities that Dora brought up earlier, like does abjection explain, is, is sense explain some of these um, aesthetic qualities that we, um, that we see in the various um, projects that you, that you showed? Can you elaborate a little bit? Well, earlier Dora was talking about um, tiling and um, you know vitreous surfaces and the kind of sanitary aesthetics. So you know, historically, hospitals and and today, <laughs> hospitals are places where you know many of the kinds of um, foul um, you know substances and experiences that um, Lucia brought up are you know are, they're central, right? Um, so I wonder if, if part of the aesthetics, particularly like the, the shift to like a, a forest-like aesthetics, the domestic aesthetics is a way to um, counteract those qualities. I mean, that must, that must be there in some way, right? Okay, yeah, no, I follow you, I, I think. Um, so there's something compensatory load that is sort of, there are two cats on this call, which is delightful, um, at least. So um, the compensatory sort of, load placed onto the non non medical uh, parts of the spaces to sort of uh, address the part of you that might uh, wish for a particular kind of sensory experience um, and then maybe to address it in a very lush way because the places where uh, the essential business or the essential interpersonal transactions or, or transactions with machinery or various technology happen are often deprived of that kind of thing. So this is this um, this comes through in the profession as some of you on the call might be really aware of this and for others of you it might be news but it, typically in healthcare practices you have planners and designers and planners do the layouts so that all the flows are good. And so it's kind of optimal in terms of efficiency and safety. And then the designers put on the skin and maybe they fight about whether something can be six inches bigger or smaller and the designers do the lobby. And so I, it, it's, it's, um, it's so whatever objection of senses that is, is going on is becoming, you know, um, it's coming into this particular kind of division of labor and that uh, that is the the sort of problem facing the profession as regards this issue. Is there sort of a way of structuring the work um, that kind of keeps us trapped in that sort of that sort of problem? Uh, and Dora has a question. It, yeah, I mean, I think it's just continuing into this conversation a little bit, you know, I mean, I'm quite struck uh, so far by um, the kind of incipient role of modernism and the preferences for modernism and architecture and how modernism does that tied to a, a rationale of being the appropriate architectural response to hygiene. And I think that's, in, you know, in a sense, what I was asking earlier, um, I'm reminded very much of, you know, Walter Benjamin's, uh, you know, 19th uh, Paris capital of the 19th century in which modernization is also you know, very much a tactic of the abjection of bodies that, you know, turns bodies into, you know, uh, puerile, stinking, you know, uh, grotesque things. And, uh, um, and 
the you know enforcement of things like you know everything from uh, in 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 Lucia's you know wonderful paper uh, about uh, the water closet and the mechanical system, as well as uh, the 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 just the the kind of look of modernism being enforced as the look of hygiene. I guess it's not a question. I guess <laughs> sorry. <laughs> More, I'm just trying to engage the 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 subject here. I you know I, I I suspect, and I think this is what I'm really asking is, is there not a bias in these healthcare designs toward modernism because modernism has been uh, 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 wheeling around on the wheels of of a supposed uh, greater hygiene. Uh, yeah, there's a there. I would say that there is. Uh, so, in, you know, one place to look is to go back to the Nightingale Wards, and there came from them a really exact dimensioning of space. It was my asthma uh, theory of contagion. It happened to work for germs, <laughs> you know, because because her empiricism was quite good, even if her theory was really bad. And so the way that spaces she. she Florence Nightingale had observed some really bad war hospitals and that people recovered better basically under trees than they did in hospitals. Um, and so she began to parameterize the kinds of conditions that each body needed. It was a volume of space, it was a height of window, it was a distance between beds. And that's still with us, I mean, com completely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the format of it is a bit different. But the, the, actually some of the specific parameterizations are still with us. Different numbers, but same categories. Can I ask, this is sort of a, a strange, maybe a strange sounding question, Julie, but is, it, is there anything, any connection between what you're just talking about and, and sort of the, the way that lobbies in modernist sort of hospital buildings are always, they always seem to be bigger and more open than, than I mean, I'm thinking about my, some of my earlier work on, on the history of smell specifically and and one of the things that i learned um is is that smell is typically considered a kind of threshold sense right right it it demarcates a transition from one space to another in a very sort of um profound way oftentimes so is there i mean again is there intentional kind of design in in those buildings or is it is is maybe the sort of a holdover of uh from this earlier kind of thing that you were just talking about do you mean specifically lobbies? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So, um, gosh, I mean, it's it's. I'm I'm maybe kind of asking you to speculate. I don't I don't I don't know if there's an actual answer to it, but there's probably an interesting history of the, the hospital lobby that could be written because when you go back to early modern, it wasn't a space, um, and it is. Um, because it was usually pavilions that were interconnected with the colonnade, with the colonnaded, you know, um, walkways. Um, so I don't know when it emerged, and that would seem sort of important. Um, and I don't know if it had to do with it, at some point bringing a family member to the hospital was to say goodbye to them for whatever period of time it was going to be. And now you can kind of go in with them and, and pretty much stay with them in many conditions. And of course, not, not during COVID. Um, so I'm guessing that it's probably emerging somewhere where the, the whole person of the patient, including that they come with some kind of social context, begins to be acknowledged and spaces begin to be created for that person. We saw that you know Dale had waiting rooms, you know, in some of the examples he showed. And if you go back, not even very far, you see the examples where they don't have them. So I, I'm not sure where it comes from, and so that's why that's that's as far as I can go with it. Um, we we have run over a bit, so we we probably should move move on. Jake, uh, can I yeah. add a comment? Yeah. I, I, at least a, a points, at least a couple of points of convergence between our two papers, as odd as it would seem. But um, I, I, I feel that we are we were both tackling 
the sort of a, a divergence uh, between uh, planners' intentions and uh, and and users or, or or patients or or inhabitants' contingent experiences of those spaces and how the two did not necessarily uh, align. Um, and then um, also the issue of circulation, the promise of um, sort of uh, enabling or building a space for flows and circulation and uh, seamless transitions and how that promise would, would sometimes run into like stumbling blocks or issues or problems with stagnation and this sort of lack of free circulation. I'll just leave it like that, but because we know, I know that we ran out of time, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, that, was, that was great. 